So when I greet you this morning, I'm going to say Jesus is alive. And I want you to shout back to me, he is alive indeed. Because that is the way that during the first couple of years and decades in the early church, that's how they greeted one another. When the disciples got together, uh, first in Jerusalem and then as the gospel spread, when they saw each other, they would say, hey, Jesus is alive. And the response would be, he's alive indeed. So, okay, I'm going to say, Jesus is alive, and you're going to say, he is alive indeed, all right? And you guys watch online, and you guys listen to this, do it as well. I can't see you, I can't hear you, but greet back as well. You ready? Here we go. Jesus is alive. He is alive indeed. Jesus is alive. He is alive indeed. One more time. Jesus is alive. He is alive indeed. Amen, and he is alive indeed. Come on, let's give my clap offering this morning. Let's rejoice. In the fact that Jesus is alive. Amen. <laughs> Praise God. Welcome everyone here present, those of you online, those of you listening on the audio. It is great to be together. And as I've just been spending this time worshiping the Lord, just focusing, you hear every song has to do somehow with, with the new life, with resurrection, and with the theme of today. And you know, as I'm sitting over there, I'm just singing these songs. And of course, some of these songs, we have sung them before, but, but I'm just allowing that message to, to wash over me again. On a day like today, when we know that on this day, so many years ago, Jesus walked out of that tomb. You know, it has such a fresh meaning. And again, as we've heard this morning, I pray that today and the message today and the fact of the resurrection of Jesus won't be so familiar to us that we say, oh yeah, of course, man. We know that. We've heard it so many times. Yeah, yeah, no hadach yet. No, 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 no. Let's allow that message to be fresh again in our hearts and in our lives as we allow a fresh revelation of the goodness of the Lord, of the fact that Jesus is alive to hit us anew. Amen. Before we continue, just a quick announcement and just a word of thank you as well to all of those who helped on Thursday with soups and breads set up and kitchen work. And uh, thank you to the, all the other teams that made the service uh, possible. And of course, thank you to everyone who attended and was part of that uh, service. It is the first time that we had a, a last supper service with soup and bread since the pandemic. Our last one had been before the pandemic, you know. And I must say the response was beyond expectation. And so we praise the Lord for his presence with us and for what he did in many lives that night. Amen. Praise God. For those of you in Capital Park and surroundings, the Capital Park prayer meeting will be this Wednesday, 3rd April from 7 to 8 p.m. at the community center in Mayburg Street. And for the youth, that's all high schoolers and, and young adults, uh, and for all the youth, is the youth say, hey. hey. Ay, 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 we must wake up. <laughs> Let's try again. Youth, say, hey. hey. Okay, all right, youth meeting. Start again this term, this Friday, okay, 5 April, this Friday over here at uh, 7 p.m. So youth, be here, okay? Amen. That's it with announcements. Let's dive into the message. Resurrection Sunday. That's what today is, Resurrection Sunday. Of course, on Friday and, of course, Saturday, the, uh, the disciples of Jesus, they were, they were scattered. C can you imagine? You've been spending, you know, maybe two to three years, depending on how, how early you, you joined the band of disciples. Well, I'd say three years average. You've been following this person who says he's the son of God and he does all these amazing things and you know, miracles and so on. And you think, that's it. He's the Messiah. He's the one who is going to liberate us. And, and you follow him and you've got your faith in him and expectation in him. And then all of a sudden, he gets killed and buried and he's gone. 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 And all your investment of time and energy and faith, that, that Sabbath before the Sunday must have been the darkest, saddest, worst Sabbath of their lives. They didn't know what to do. There was shame, there was shame because they've been following this guy and talking about, you know, and, and now he's gone. Crucified. Exposed as, you know, I don't know what. So can you just imagine? But, but like we said on, said on Friday, it's Friday, but Sunday is coming. Uh, you know, 
what is interesting is that the disciples, that band of men, and even the women that were around, they heard Jesus saying, hey, I'm going to Jerusalem. They're going to kill me. But on the third day, I will rise again. But they all seem to have forgotten because they were sad. In fact, on Sunday morning, the women got their spices together to go all the way back to the tomb to finish preparing his body. Because they did, they did in a rush on that Friday evening before the Sabbath. They quickly just wrapped him and, and, and put him in the tomb. They didn't finish the proper preparation. So they're going to go back and do it. The biggest concern is who is going to roll that stone, <laughs> you know, which is in front of the, of the tomb. And to their surprise, when they get there, the stone is rolled away. So, oh, that's going to be easy. And, and they walk in, <laughs> and the body is gone. <gasps> Obviously, somebody stole the body. But who? And then two men with shining clothes speak to them and say, hey, what are you doing here? He's not dead. He's alive. They go, what? <laughs> okay. They run back full of excitement and they tell the disciples, you know, and the disciples go, praise God. We knew it. We knew it. We knew it. Jesus said it, and we believed it. Praise God. Is that what they said? No ways. The Bible says they didn't believe the woman. And Peter ran off to get make sure <laughs> that it was really empty and that Jesus was gone. They were confused. What is going on? But then, the man himself, Jesus, appears to them. They go, what? Oh, you big fright. But he showed himself to them. And then they realized, slowly but surely, Jesus is alive. And as we, as we, we, we heard on the, in, in that Lost Supper um, sermon, Jesus told them, you know, a bunch of things. And it didn't quite make sense to them until afterwards when he was resurrected. Then it began to make sense to them. And so this is it. We are talking about resurrection, the third day. The resurrection of Jesus from the dead is the foundation of our belief as Christians that death does not have the final say. Why? Because Jesus was resurrected. We will also be resurrected. You see, his resurrection, listen, his resurrection guarantees the future resurrection guarantees our future resurrection as we shall see in this message and so what we celebrate today is not just a religious belief it's not a a part of our doctrine no what we celebrate today is a historical fact you hear that we celebrate a historical fact the message today is called death defeated Death defeated. And our reading today comes from 1 Corinthians chapter 15, which is also known as the resurrection chapter. We're not going to read the whole chapter, but do yourself a favor and spend some time reading it today, tomorrow. And uh, it's all about resurrection. Paul makes a, a great argument and case for the resurrection of Jesus and, of course, our future resurrection. So, that chapter 15 begins with a declaration of the gospel. Amen? The gospel. Gospel means good news. And so we, let's, let's read quickly. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 to 11 says, Moreover, brethren, I declare to you the gospel, the good news, which I preached to you. Now, he's writing to the church in Corinth. That's why the book is called Corinthians. It's the church that existed in Corinth. It was made up of Jews and Gentiles who had come to believe in Jesus. Most of those Jews, they had been living in Greece for a long time. They were like Greek-speaking Jews. And uh, they were exposed to the local culture of the people at that time. And so he's writing to them and he says, listen, I came and, he, and Paul is the one in one of his missionary journeys. He went to Greece and he preached and he planted a church over there. So he says, I declare to you the gospel which I preached to you, which you also received... And in which you stand, by which also you are saved. So how are you saved? By receiving the gospel, receiving the good news, and standing 
in the good news, believing the good news. That's how you are saved. It's not by the rituals you do or how many good deeds you perform. Salvation comes through a belief, putting your trust, completely embracing a certain truth. And so he declares again what he was talking about. For I delivered to you, first of all, that which I also received. Oh, okay. So Paul is not just preaching something which you just heard someone else and he's passing on. No, he is preaching to them what he himself received. In other words, he also had to receive, believe, stand on it. First, he stood on it. First, he believed. First, he received. In other words, first, he was saved. And now, he takes that message and he brings it to Corinth. And he gives it to the people. And he says that they believe that message. What was the message? For I deliver to you, first of all, that which I also received. That. Yes, yes the message. Yes, the gospel. That Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. Christ the word Christ in Greek is the same as the word Messiah in Hebrew. It means the anointed one, Christos, the anointed one. is Messiah in the, in the Hebrew, the anointed one. That Christ, that the anointed one, that Messiah died, okay, for our sins, corporately, according to the scriptures. And that he was buried why was he buried? Because he was dead. Some people say, oh, no, no, Jesus didn't die. He just fainted on the cross. Really? Listen, one thing about those Romans, they knew how to kill a man, man. Those guys were brute. And crucifixion was a well-established practice at that time. Nobody came out of that cross alive. They made sure of that. So why was Jesus buried? Because he was D-E-A double deed dead. Very dead. That he was buried. And that he rose again the third day. According to the scriptures. He died on the first day. There was a somber second day. Everybody was confused. Everybody, nobody knew what was going on. But on the third day, he rose again. Hallelujah, he rose from the dead. Amen. According to the scriptures. And that he was seen by Cephas, that's Peter, then by the 12. After that, he was seen by over 500 brethren at once. Talking about Jesus. So Jesus, it wasn't just the, the apostles that said he's alive. No, Jesus was seen by the apostles, but by many other people. During a period of 40 days before he ascended to heaven, he showed himself to many people at one stage to 500 people at once. You cannot fool 500 people at once, especially in those days where there were no holographics or fancy technology to, to make believe that he was there. All right? 500 people at once. And um, of whom the greater part remain to the present, but some have fallen asleep. So by the time that Paul is writing this letter to the Corinth, of those 500, some had already passed on. They, they died, but some were still alive. In other words, saying, listen, if you don't believe, I can show you these guys. Let's, let's go and talk to them. We've got witnesses over here that saw him alive. So he's establishing the fact that Jesus did rise from the dead. After that, he was seen by James and then by all the apostles. And then... Last of all, you are seen by me also, as one, as one born out of due time. He's talking about himself now, Paul. For I am the least of the apostles, who am not worthy to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. And if you go to the book of Acts, you read about it. Paul was, was a staunch Jew. He was, he was, he was radical, man. It's either the Jewish way or the highway or the, you know. And he persecuted the church. He, over, he, he was the overseer of killings of Christians. 
just, it was radical, man. So what is he doing here now? I persecuted the church of God, but by the grace of God, I am what I am. <clears throat> because Jesus met with him. And he saw Jesus. You see, to be an apostle in that first century, in the, in, at that time, you could only be an apostle if you had seen Jesus face to face. Today, apostle has a different meaning. Today, an apostle is a, a church planter. Somebody goes somewhere, plants a church, starts a church, raises up leaders and so on, and then moves on, you know, and, and he, he, he oversees a number of churches. He has an apostolic gift to look after. So today, the, the meaning of an apostle is different to what it was here in the beginning. To be an apostle at this time, you had to have seen Jesus face to face. That's how it began. And so Paul had seen. But, but, like, but like he says, man, I'm an out of time guy because all the others lived with Jesus, walked with Jesus. I persecuted them. But then I saw Jesus. And I know that he's alive. And so here I am. I am what I am. Okay? And therefore, whether it was I or they that preached, so we preach. So all the apostles are preaching the same thing. What are they preaching? The gospel. What is the gospel? That Christ died for our sins according to the scripture. That he was buried. That he rose again on the third day according to the scripture. And that he was seen by many. Do you believe that? And that is what he was preaching. And so we preach and so you believe. So the people in Corinth, when they heard these news, they believed so we preached, and so you believed. And I hope that every one of us here today, every one of you watching there, every one of you listening to this message, I hope that you have believed. Have you believed? Do you believe? However, some of those who believe, and that's, that's the message for us, we have to be so very careful. Some of those who believed in Corinth, began to have some doubts. And they began to claim that there was no resurrection of the dead. They said, well, we are Christians. We believe in Jesus. We believe he died for our sins. But we don't believe there is a resurrection of the dead. Okay. So you believe in Jesus who died and rose from the dead, but you don't believe there is a resurrection of the dead? How come? Why? Why is that? Perhaps some of those Jewish believers had been influenced by the Sadducees. Remember, there was, there was different sects. The Pharisees and the Sadducees were like the Jewish religious leaders. The Sadducees did not believe in the resurrection of the dead. Even though resurrection was a Jewish concept, even though generally the Jewish people believed in one day there being a resurrection of the dead... Somehow, this group of people called Sadducees, they, they lost their belief. And I said, this is it. We live, you know, we live for God. Yeah, we do whatever we can. And we will, and, but when we did, we did. And it's gone. It's finished. And, and maybe some of these Christians gave ears to the Sadducees, and they began to agree with them that there is no resurrection of the dead. I mean, how many resurrected dead have you spoken to lately? So you see, there's no resurrection of the dead. Maybe some of the Greek believers were being influenced by some of the ancient Greek philosophies that stated that this is all, it, all there is. Once you're dead, you're gone. You know? So whatever it was, some of them were believing that they were, there was no resurrection. And we know that already in the first century, there were false teachings and false teachers and people getting into the church and teaching false stuff already back then bringing deception bringing confusion to the believers back then already and some of their descendants are still with us today they still go around in churches and and to individuals and try and take them away from the gospel of christ it's amazing as long as you're a sinner living out in the world nobody cares about you and then you become a Christian, you start getting to church, and all of a sudden, all sort of religious people want to know you and want to teach you the right way, their right way, and take you away from the Word of God. Huh? 
And so in verse 12 to 19, Paul starts, says, okay, so you say there is no resurrection. If there is no res the resurrection, let me paint you a picture of what that future looks like, of what that life looks like. And so from verse 12 to 19, he describes the consequences if there is no resurrection and how that would play out. And in, from verses 12 to 19, he says the following, if there is no resurrection, then that means that Christ has not risen. So how can I say that Christ is risen if there is no, if what you say is true, that there is no resurrection, then Christ could not have risen, right? Hmm? And if Christ has not risen and there is no resurrection, then our preaching and our faith is empty. Well, why am I preaching to you about a future in, in, with God and resurrection if there is no resurrection? If there is no resurrection, We are false witnesses of God because I'm preaching something which does not exist. We as apostles and teachers are false witnesses of God. And, and if there is no resurrection, that means you and I, we are still in our sins because the whole point of Jesus dying and being resurrected was he died for our sins. And he rose again to establish that covenant and that fact and that he is really the Christ. If there is no resurrection, then he is not the Christ, and therefore we are still in our sins. We are lost. And if there is no resurrection, then those who have fallen asleep in Christ, you know, part of those 500 who saw Jesus, who have died already, and guess what? If there is no resurrection, then they're just gone forever. Gone. And then he ends with verse 19. He concludes... If in this life only we have hope in Christ, in other words, if we believe only while you're alive and there is no resurrection of the dead, then we are of all, of all men, we are the most pitiable. Why are we pitiable? Because here we are, and this is first century, okay? Here we are now as apostles suffering persecution, being thrown into prison, being beaten, being chased away. You as followers of Christ are having Uh, your, your lives challenged, your lives are in danger from the Romans and from the Jews. We are doing all this, sacrificing all this for a gospel which is a lie. We are pitiable little creatures. You see the picture? Christ's resurrection has rendered the resurrection of the dead both necessary and inevitable. If Christ died and rose again, then the dead in Christ must rise again. That is the message of the gospel. And that is what he's bringing out here. Now, of course, if we hope in Christ in this life only, it's not in vain, okay? Because he makes a difference in our lives. Amen? He, you know, if we follow Christ, we're going to be better neighbors, better parents, better husbands and, and wives, better fathers and mothers, because if we follow the principles of Christ, it will make you a better person. No doubt about that. But it's not just about that, because following Christ has benefits in this life And in eternity, hallelujah, it's forever. And so, the Apostle Paul, the, as we've read, the one who considers himself not worthy of being called an apostle, but he's deeply aware of the grace of God in his life, and he saw Jesus. So he knows that Jesus is alive. He proceeds to declare that indeed death is is defeated. And he does this from verses 20 to 28, which is the core of our message today. Let's read verses 20 to 28 of 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Amen. But now Christ is risen. So he says, you, you, some of you guys don't believe that he's, he's, he's risen. And, and this is what's going to happen if there's no resurrection. But now Christ is. So he, he emphasizes the fact. Listen, make no mistake. Christ is risen. He is risen from the dead and has become the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. What does he mean by first fruits? Okay. 
For since by man came death, by man also came the resurrection of the dead. Guys, I want us today just to, again, you know, this is such a familiar message. Let's just stop for a moment and let the word of God bring this understanding, this revelation. Let it ground us, amen, on the fact that Jesus is alive. And because he's alive, there's a whole bunch of consequences to your life, to my life, to our present, and to our future. Listen to what he's saying. For as in Adam all die. We are all descendants of Adam. And guess what? Latest statistics show that all people die. If you live long enough, you're going to die. Why? Because in Adam, what Adam did his separation, his disobedience to God, his separation of God has consequences which ripple from that time until today. But as in Adam all die, even so in Christ all shall be made alive. You see, in Christ, there is a time coming, he said, it points to the future. In Christ, all shall be made alive. In Christ, all shall be made alive. But each one in his own order. Christ the first fruits. Afterward, those who are Christ's. When? At his coming. So when will the resurrection take place of those who believe in Christ? At his coming. When he comes again. Remember, he left us with a promise to return. He says, I am going, but I am coming. And even on the day that he ascended, the angels stood by there saying, hey guys, why are you guys looking up? The same Jesus that you saw going up, he's going to come again. And he is. And people say, oh, but he's taking so long, he's taking so long. I mean, you know, if he came quick, quickly, you know, I wouldn't have to do this, I wouldn't have to do that, you know. And, but the Bible is clear, there is a time for everything. There is a time. There is an appointed time. And if you read your Bible, and if you know your Bible, you might have noticed by now that God is not in a hurry for anything. I mean, the apostles wrote, He's coming soon. That was 2,000 years ago. All right? When God made a promise to, when, when Adam and Eve sinned, and God said, don't worry, one is coming that will tramp the serpent you know, on the head, God already laid out. There's a future. Don't worry. This is going to be sorted out. It took 4,000 years. And then he came. So God is not in a hurry. And the reason he's not in a hurry is to give you and I time to make our decision. To realize that he is God. To realize that we are sinners. To realize that we need salvation. To realize that our works cannot save us. We cannot save ourselves. Have you tried? Have you tried keeping the Ten Commandments lately for more than a week? But you can't keep it for a day. Okay, you haven't killed anybody, fine. But let's talk about your thought life. Let's talk about your speech. Let's talk about your temper and your tongue and your actions and huh? we cannot save ourselves. And the sooner we realize that, the better. We need a savior. Anyway. <laughs> so let's carry on. Then comes the end. After his coming, after Jesus comes again, after that, then comes the end when he, Jesus, delivers the kingdom to God the Father, whom, when he puts an end to all rule and all authority and power. So it's a time coming when Jesus is going to put an end to all the rule and power and authority on this earth. It's going to finish, and it's all going to come under him. And then he's going to hand this kingdom over to the Father. For he must reign until he has put all the enemies of God under his feet. Now, 
the last enemy that will be destroyed is death. Death is our biggest enemy, isn't it? Because we make so many plans and we want to achieve so much and then along comes death and just spoils everything. Lousy enemy. Usually at the most inconvenient time. Huh? For he has put all things under his feet. But when he says all things are put under him, it is evident that he who put all things under his feet is accepted. Now, when all things are made subject to him, then the Son himself will also be subject to him who put all things under him, that God may be all in all. Is that clear? <laughs> we'll get back to that, all right? It's a bit of a tongue twister over there. Now, let's take a closer look at these verses, okay? Verse 20. But now... Christ is risen from the dead and has become the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. First fruits of those who have fallen asleep. Now, to us, it might say, that, that's weird. What do you mean first fruits? But to the people in Corinth, where a bunch of them were Jewish or they had fellowship with Jewish people and understood the Jewish culture. For the Jewish people, that makes a, makes a lot of sense. Why? Because God gave the Jewish people seven feasts, okay? Uh, some of them took place in spring. Some of them took place in autumn. Uh, if we go back again to Middle Eastern time, remember Thursday we said you are in Middle Eastern time. We're in Jerusalem now, okay? Uh, and if we were in Jerusalem, we would be in spring right now. In South Africa, we're in autumn, but in the Northern Hemisphere, it is spring. And so the, there, were, there were these spring feasts, which are harvest feasts, and there were a couple of feasts they had to do. And this weekend, they actually had, had three feasts which took place. It was a Passover when they remember the, the, the blood and the lamb and the, the, the release of Egypt. And then there was the unleavened bread. And, you know, with that Jewish people for a week, that we eat unleavened bread. In, in, the, in the biblical uh, context and, and tradition, uh, leaven is equivalent to sin, okay? So unleavened bread means sinless, means pure. And it was a reflection of Jesus. He is the bread of heaven, right? Okay. He says, I am the bread of life, he said, right? He was born in Bethlehem, the house of bread. That's what Bethlehem means. Okay. So, so Jesus is our bread of life. And he was sinless. And so he could be the, the lamb of God. And he could take our punishment because he is sinless, the unleavened bread. But then on the, on the third day, on the Sunday, was the Feast of first fruits. It was the barley harvest. And so what people would do is, they, as soon as that barley begins to get ripe, before they start harvesting it, they would go to the field, and every, every farm would go there, and they would take a little sheath, cut off, and bring it to the temple, and the priest would wave it before God. And that wave offering meant a blessing over the harvest. That waving before God means this, this is accepted. And God accepting this sheaf means he accepted the whole harvest. It means you'd bless the whole harvest. For the Jewish culture and according to God's law, the harvest was not kosher. It was not acceptable until the sheaf had been waved before God. And there were also some sacrifices which they made. Now they could go back and start harvesting. And the fact that they came to the temple and, and did the, 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 the waving and received God's blessing, that action guaranteed them a good harvest. Because every time they obeyed God and did things God's way, they got a good harvest. Now you'd think they would do that all the time. No, they didn't inevitably they would slip away and turn their backs on God and, and suffer the consequences. But whenever they obeyed God, they were blessed. And so by doing the wave offering, coming to the temple, they were guaranteed a good offering. They knew. They couldn't see it yet because they haven't started harvesting it. But the fact that they brought it before God, they knew. Good harvest is coming. They could see it. Down the road, we're going to have a great time, great harvest. And then they would go, and they would start harvesting. And they would have a great harvest. Guess what? Jesus rose on the day of the feast of first fruits. And that's why now Paul is tying all this together, because you see, 
those Jewish feasts are actually prophetic. Those seven feasts are actually the history of mankind in symbolic form. In the life of Jesus, he fulfilled all of the spring feasts. There's four of them. We've got one coming in uh, 50 days' time, which is what? Pentecost. Okay, we'll talk about that later. But he fulfilled all the spring feasts. Then there was a gap. And then comes the autumn feasts. Another four of them there, or three of them there. Yeah, four here and three there. Those are still to be fulfilled. And when are they going to be fulfilled? At his coming. The gap between the spring feasts and the autumn feasts, that gap is symbolic of the church age. The time of the Gentiles. Our time. The time of the Gentiles will come to an end. The period which we call the period of grace, which is where we're living right now, is going to come to an end. And then Christ will take his church. Amen. There will be the rapture. There will be the supper of the Lamb. He will come back to this earth. He will establish his kingdom. He will, you know, there's the hope. That's another stuff. Okay, another story, not for today. Okay? But that's going to happen in, in, in due course. And we're getting closer and closer to that time. If you look at the news these days, you're going to realize that uh, a lot of the prophetic stuff which was spoken by Jesus and by the prophets and by Daniel and so on, it's happening in our days, guys. So if Peter and, and Paul said that the, the day is coming, Jesus is coming very soon, how soon do you think it is now, 2,000 years later? We are really, really, really at the end of days. And we need to live with God, for God, be right with God, make sure our lives are pleasing to him because he could return at any moment. Or we could go to him at any moment because like I said, death happens in the most inconvenient times when you're not expecting it. Okay? So that's the, so what Paul is saying is he has become the first fruit of those who have fallen asleep. Amen? And so the, the word first implies that there will be more. Otherwise, it would be the only fruit, <laughs> okay? But it's the first fruits. First fruit means there will be others, and there will be a whole harvest of people who will eventually also be raised from the dead. And of course, that day, that Sunday, in the Jewish culture, was a day of joy, okay? It was a day of joy, as they brought their sheaths, and they waved before the Lord, and sacrificed because they were anticipating a great harvest. Amen? And all the celebration that would come with that. And in the same way that it was then a day of joy, it is a day of joy for us as well. It should be a day of great joy for us as believers in Christ. Because we are expectant of a great harvest when he returns. And the dead are raised in Christ. Every single one has gone before us. Every single loved one that you've lost, the pain that you felt at losing family members and friends, be it to whatever it was, this whole pandemic section and illnesses, disease, accidents, all that pain, we have something to look forward to, the resurrection of the dead and our reunion together. It will take place. How do I know? Because Christ rose from the dead. And because God accepted that sacrifice, it was acceptable to him. Therefore, we know that the dead in Christ will also rise up. Amen. Praise God. Somebody say amen. Because that's good news, man. That is good news. Amen. <laughs> All right. Wow. 2021. For since by man came death... By man also came the resurrection of the dead. Jesus as a, the, the, a man, Adam, brought sin into the world. Now remember, Jesus was fully God and fully man. And as a man, he died on the cross. As a man, he rose again. And by the way, when you talk about resurrection in the gospel and in this message, it means 
you rise again never to die again. Look, Jesus brought people back from the dead. In the Old Testament, people came back from the dead. In our day, there are many people that have come back from the dead. I have personally witnessed, you know, testimonies of people that come back from the dead. But every person that comes back from the dead comes back to their normal earthly body, lives a few more years, and dies again. Jesus did not die again. He wasn't just resuscitated. He was resurrected, and he came in a new body. Later in this chapter, he says that we, 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 we sow a corruptible body, but it's an incorruptible body. There was a body that can never die again, which is resurrected. And so when you come back to life, you're not coming back in this old shaggy body full of aches and pains and bumps and thumps. You're going to come back in your best body, man. Okay? Full of energy, full of life, and that body is incorruptible. Cannot get hurt, cannot die, cannot get sick, cannot get diseases, and it can go through walls. <laughs> By the way, I'm just checking him because that's what Jesus did, right? The, the disciples are locked up inside, and all of a sudden, peace be with you. What? <laughs> Who said that? Yeah, hello, I'm Jesus. <laughs> Just by the way, okay? Just something extra to look forward to, okay? Anyway, so just as by, by man came death, by man came resurrection of the dead. Amen? And so Jesus brought that to us. Now, when he says, all shall be made alive, he says, in Christ, all shall be made alive. It doesn't mean that everybody that dies will be resurrected and spend eternity with Jesus because a lot of people who die do not believe in Jesus. Now, here's the thing. Everyone shall be resurrected eventually. But those who die in Christ will be resurrected first and they're going to spend eternity with Christ. Later on, those who died not believing in Christ will also be resurrected but to be separated from God eternally. To be judged and separated. But everybody will be resurrected. You choose when you want to be resurrected. At the coming of Christ to spend eternity with him or later for the judgment and separation of God. And we know and we all know that if you're separated, of, if you're separated from God, it's like hell, man. We get to choose now by our choices, our actions. How, it's, it's the, what's the gospel? It's a choice to believe and give your life and trust and follow Jesus Christ. Yeah. What have you got to lose by following Jesus Christ? Verses 23 and 24. But each one in his own order. Christ, the first fruits. Afterwards, those who are Christ's at his coming. You see? So there's an order. So Christ rose up first. To show us, to prove to us, to demonstrate to us, this is what resurrection, resurrection looks like. You come back to life, and you've got this eternal body, never to die again. And that's what's going to happen to you if you believe in me. So first Christ, he's the first fruit. Then the second, third, fourth, fifth, blah, 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 all the others, when does it happen? At his coming. Those who are Christ, you see, at his coming. All believers, when, when the trumpet sounds, they shall be resurrected. There's a time that's coming. We don't know that time. That's why we have to be ready. Don't go fooling around now. Don't go playing around with sin. Don't go turn your back on God and his commandments. Don't go and try and cut corners now. You never know when that trumpet could sound. So let's live every day ready to go. Because the Bible says when the trumpet sound, the dead in Christ shall be risen. They will resurrect. If you are alive, you're going to be changed, transformed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, your mortal body will be changed into an eternal body and you're going to fly away and join up with the resurrected guys and be with the Lord. Must I say it again? <laughs> you guys are missing opportunity to say amen, hallelujah, and do a little dance there, man. Because that is where we're going. 
That's why today, you see guys, Resurrection Sunday, it, it changed the world. It changed the order of things. Resurrection Sunday changed everything, but everything. Because from that day, nothing was ever the same again. And the ripple effects of that day continue with us today. And wait until Jesus returns. Then, <laughs> oh my goodness. Okay. Let's carry on. Then comes the end when he delivers the kingdom to God the Father and he puts an end to all rule and all authority and power. You see, when Jesus returns, he's going to overpower all powers in the earth. I don't care who's the president, who's the world leader, who's, who's heading who, you know, or, or, or what is the latest political, you know, philosophy. Jesus is going to overpower everything. Why? Because he can. He is Lord. Amen? He is Lord. And so he's going to overpower every, everything. You see, and then he says, put all to rule, authority and power is going to put, going to be all about, all, above all that. You see, the Father has entrusted Jesus with a kingdom. Jesus be made the ruler of this kingdom. He's the intercessor of his kingdom. He's interceding for us right now. But you see, there will come a time when Jesus doesn't have to do that work anymore. And that's what the next verse is. In verse 25 and 26. For he must reign until he has put all enemies under his feet. And the last enemy that will be destroyed is death. You see, Jesus shall reign until all enemies, all enemies of God, everything that is against God's will has been put under his feet. And the last enemy that's going to go is death. Yay. Okay? That's going to be the last one that's going to go. And therefore, we are living in a timeline, guys. There are some religions that think we're living in a circle, you know. You're born, you live, you die, you reincarnate, you're born, you live, you die, you reincarnate, you're born, you live, and you carry on and on and on. And some of them, it's a thing like this. You live, born, live, and then you get more and more perfect, more perfect, and, and then you, you reach nirvana. You know, right? yeah. uh, but the fact is, no, uh, the, the universe is not circular, it's linear. It started there, it's going to end over there. There's a timeline. There's a timeline. And one day... Jesus is going to put an end to all the enemies of God. And finally, he's going to put an end to death. And now, once death is gone, Jesus doesn't have to work anymore. Because right now, he's our intercessor. And he's our healer. And he's this and he's that. But once all the enemies are gone, there is no death, there is no sickness, no disease. His work is finished. And so he's going to turn back to God the Father and say, Father... It's been great. This partnership has been wonderful. Yeah. Here's your kingdom. Restored. Why? Because just as it was before the fall of man, perfect unity between God and man, Jesus is going to bring the whole thing full circle at the end here and restore it back to God the Father again. Now, Jesus is God all the time. Okay? But there comes a time where his, his function as mediator, his function as intercessor, is going to come to an end. Why? Not needed anymore. Because you are all going to be living in his presence. In a new heaven. A new earth. Imagine that. No war. No political parties fighting one another. No different systems, you know, battling for your money or whatever. You, so, there's, there's, a, there's a timeline. Amen? And even death itself will be no more. And then this leads us to the, the last verse of this passage. You'd say, for he has put all things under his feet, it's under, under quotes. And, and that is actually a, a quote from Psalm 8, uh, uh, verse 6. In the original qu context, that psalm celebrates the fact that God has given man, you know, he's, he's, God's given this universe to man to look after. But, but Paul here, he, he adapted that, that verse to say that God has put all things in subjection to Christ. So 
But when he says all things are put under him, it is evident that he, God the Father, who put all things under him, Jesus, is accepted. Of course, when, when God the Father gave Jesus the kingdom and says, now everything must become under your feet, God the Father, of course, is accepted. He's not under Jesus' feet, okay? Because him and Jesus are equally God, all right? But the kingdom is under the responsibility of Jesus, He's the mediator. He's the one that died for this kingdom. Died for our sins. He's the one that is interceding for us. Right? And then he says, Now, when all things are made subject to him, when all things are made subject to Jesus, then the Son himself will also be subject to him who put all things under him. In other words, then the son will also be subject to the father. Again, it's not a matter of one is bigger than the other. It's a matter of right now, the ministry of Jesus is a temporary ministry. There comes a time when this kingdom is fulfilled. His work is finished. He's going to hand it back to the Father. Say, Father, here you go. It is yours again. The whole kingdom is yours. Thank you. It's been wonderful. Now, I'm giving it back to you. That's why he's subjecting it back to God again. Giving it back to the Lord. He's completed his work. That will be when the full job will be completed. And by the way, that is when our salvation is completed as well. Because then we'll be saved spirit, soul, and body with our resurrected bodies, our new bodies. That's when everything gets wrapped up. It's in the end. Amen. So that God may be all in all, just like it was in the garden when man was created. God was all in all. God was in everything. God could walk and talk with us. We're going back there again, guys. There are days coming when God will be all in all. Eventually, all things will be under Jesus' feet and you'll deliver to the Father. Amen? So, uh, now, for those people that were reading this letter at that time, in the first century, they were under the authority of an emperor, remember? Caesar, okay? And they had different, they had, they had different emperors, you know, the, the Greeks and the Persians and this and that and the other, but every emperor Whenever he was ruling, he was seen as the father of the universe. He had to be worshipped. They worshipped the emperor. Because the emperor was seen as the one who gave you life. Because, you know, he allowed you to do this and allowed you to do that. And, get, and, and so he was seen as the father and the giver of life. So what Paul is saying yeah, to those people, and they understood this, when he talks about the father, he's saying, guys, there is a greater father than the emperor. There is a father for eternity, a father who actually loves you, who cares for you, who wants you to be with him forever, forever. And that is the one we have to put our trust in. A time is coming where all authority will be God alone, nothing else, no human being, God alone. Now, just imagine that. So much of life today, let's take it back now to 2024. So much of life today is stained by evil. You see it every day. You open your news feed and there it is. You know, there is terrorism, tyranny. Politicians whose concern is re-election, especially this year. There are dozens of countries in the world this year who are having elections. It's weird. It's like a tsunami. It doesn't happen or regularly, but this year, it's amazing. Elections everywhere. And of course, all the politicians are concerned about re-election rather than the well-being of their people. Because once they're in, same old, same old. And we have to live in this world. Criminal behavior. Business ex executives who fill their personal pockets while running their business to the ground. And, and, and I mean, you, you know the world you live in. That's the world we live in. But when Christ comes again and puts God's enemies under his feet, all the evil that now stains our daily lives, our screens, our existence, our future, all that will be put away, will come to an end. Hallelujah. 
And that is what Resurrection Sunday reminds us of. The harvest feast points to a time where many will be resurrected and live forever in harmony with one another and in harmony with God. And it begins with a simple decision to believe in the gospel. Amen? To believe in the gospel. A decision to follow Christ and obey his word. And do not let human ideas, human philosophies, human thoughts erode that belief away. Don't let all thoughts of, ah, there's no resurrection. Ah, there is no this. Oh, there is no God. Blah, blah, blah. Ah, be careful with that. But that's the devil trying to steer you away from the reality of the resurrection of Christ and of the resurrection to spend eternity with Christ. Don't let false teachings put doubt in your head about the resurrection or anything else like it happened to some of those believers in Corinth. Let us keep our faith in the gospel of Jesus Christ, rejoicing in the fact that Jesus is alive and anticipating his return and the resurrection of the dead. Amen? Amen. 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 Jesus is alive. Jesus is alive. Do you believe that? We're going to close in prayer. And after I give the blessing, I want you to please remain seated. Don't move until somebody gives you a chocolate egg. Once you've got your egg, bye-bye. Have a wonderful Easter Sunday and a blessed week. Let us pray. Father God, we thank you for your goodness, Lord. Oh, it's so great to know that Jesus is alive, Lord. It is not just a little ritual that we perform here once a year or whatever, but it's a fact. It's a historical fact. And for us, Lord, who follow you, it is a, a meaningful fact. You have risen us, Lord. Our spirits have been made alive. We've been resurrected spiritually, Lord God. And now we look forward to the day when our bodies will be changed or resurrected and we can spend eternity in your presence. Father, thank you so much for your love for us. Lord Jesus, thank you so much for your sacrifice. Holy Spirit, thank you for the revelation and teaching you bring us. We thank you for this day, Lord. And help us to rejoice this day as we continue this day thinking of you and rejoicing in the work accomplished, not just in the cross, but in the resurrection of Jesus. Amen. And so now may the love of God the Father, the grace and the peace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be upon each one of us until we see him again face to face in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. Have a wonderful Sunday. See you again next Sunday. Praise